Okay, this is the beginning of chapter five. Uncharted territory. Chapter five is all about fluids. And if you'll notice, right at the picture of chapter five, there's a hot air balloon. And you say, air is not a fluid. It is. Sorry. It is. It acts as a fluid. Now, you're right. There is solid, liquid, gas. But fluid doesn't necessarily have to mean liquid. Fluid just means how it behaves. How, is it able to flow? Can it hold a pressure? And yes, air fits in that category. So air is a fluid. Uh, so we'll talk about how hot air balloons work when we get there. Uh, but in the meantime, there's a few other things that you need to we need to talk about. So let's go down a list of pertinent topics, okay? Concepts. The first concept you need to know is compressibility. Air, like many other fluids, is compressible. Here's what that means. You can take a certain amount of air and smash it down and squeeze it in and fit, fit more into a smaller area. For instance, you do it all the time when you pump up the tires on your car. So here's a picture of your car tire. I realize that's kind of a weird picture, but imagine if you chopped your car tire down the middle and you looked at the air inside there. The air molecules are bouncing around inside there. Let's see, you've got the oxygen molecules and the nitrogen molecules and the, let's see, air, what is it composed of? Around 72% nitrogen, 21% oxygen. Then there's carbon dioxide and then carbon monoxide and a bunch of other stuff. There's some argon and some neon and random other stuff mixed in there. But bulk of it is nitrogen and oxygen, okay? So uh, that's this picture here, mostly nitrogen and oxygen, but there's some other stuff in there. And all those different molecules are bouncing around inside there. They're all moving. And you can always put more in there. Just on your bicycle pump, just pump it harder. You'll get more air in there. You just keep squeezing more and more into the same volume. Why can you put more and more into the same volume? Because it's compressible. Air is very compressible. Now let me give you an example of something that's not as compressible. Oil, not as compressible. If you, if you pumped up, uh, you filled your bicycle pump with oil and pumped it into your car tire, there would come a point where you'd go to pump more and it just wouldn't go. The tire might expand a little bit, but the amount of the oil, the oil's just not gonna compress. That's why in your brake lines, when you go to squeeze, you go to, you go to push your brake pedal, it pushes on a, 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 an unflexible line, tube, that is filled with oil, brake fluid. And when you push on it, that brake fluid pushes on the brake drum, which hits your brake and stops your car. But the whole point is, it doesn't compress. If you filled that line with air instead, as you pushed on it, the air would compress and it wouldn't push as hard on the brake drum like you want it to. So uh, that's why brake lines are filled with oil, but tires are filled with air. You want the tire to be a little bit squishy. That way when you hit over bump, when you roll over bumps, it doesn't jar the whole thing. It just kind of squishes a little bit and you keep going. Um, by the way, that's called a pneumatic tire. The invention of the pneumatic wheel, oh, it, it was huge. <laughs> Uh, before that, think of wagon wheels on, on covered wagons going across the United States to populate the West. They, they were all iron, they just had iron on there and every little bump, they, they, the whole thing was bouncing all over the place and they broke those wheels all the time because it was very jarring. So pneumatic tires make life very nice. Okay, so that's the first concept, compressibility. Your second concept is the difference between an atom and a molecule. Let me give you an example. Uh, carbon dioxide, okay? Carbon dioxide. Two oxygens, one carbon. The combination of those three things is a molecule. The oxygen alone, the other oxygen alone, and the other carbon alone are atoms. There you go. That's the distinction between atoms and molecules. Molecules are a combination of a bunch of atoms. Both are small though, okay? The, the next concept that you need to get is internal energy. 
Internal energy refers to the energy that's in a volume of gas or in the volume of a fluid. And that energy has two parts to it, potential and kinetic. So uh, let's talk about kinetic, that's easy. There's, uh, <laughs> and I, I say this, I, I chuckle right there because in my mind, my lab TA from back in my undergraduate days comes to mind and he, he had a fun accent, I think it was from India, but I'm not sure. Anyway, it was a fun accent and the way he would say it, it's translation, vibration, rotation. <laughs> And that's it. It's translation, that means moving in a straight line. Vibration, that means bouncing back and forth. And rotation, that means spinning. Those are the three forms of kinetic energy of any molecule or atom within your uh, gas or fluid. Okay, so you've got kinetic energy which can be composed of one of those three. Translation, rotation, vibration. Okay, and then uh, the other one is potential energy that exists within the bonds of a molecule. So you won't see this in your atom. Well, uh, just ignore that statement. But, but in the bonds of a molecule, there's the, the, they're held together and there's potential energy stored in that. And so you definitely do see it in an atom because an atom can be composed of other objects as well. So, uh, by the way, what are atoms composed of? You should know this. This goes back to kindergarten, right? Atoms are composed of fundamentally three things. Protons, neutrons, and electrons. And so the various combinations of those three things make up the whole periodic table. I find it fascinating that in this entire universe, in this vast diversity, think about it. I mean, from lightning to, well, not lightning, but from dirt to trees, to planets, to stars, to water that you drink, to the orange hanging off of a tree, to an ostrich running across a field. All those things are composed of three items. Electrons, protons, neutrons. That's it. That's astounding. That's astounding. The vast diversity of the universe comes down to different combinations of three things. Wow, that's amazing creativity. Okay, so uh, by the way, I, I live not too far from the armory right outside of Clinton and that sounds like a big helicopter coming into the land over there. They're active with the coronavirus going on. Anyway, so there's internal energy and that's the potential and the kinetic. Okay, uh, next piece, temperature. What does that mean? Well, you, you know intuitively what temperature means. You look it up all the time on the Weather Channel. Every morning you look up to try to figure out what's the temperature gonna be today. And you know intuitively what it means. If it's gonna be 99 today, you know it's gonna be hot, you better wear short sleeves. But you also know if it's gonna be 28 today, ooh, I better wear long sleeves and maybe a sweater on top of that, it's cold. Okay, you just, you know intuitively what temperature means, but from a physics standpoint, what does temperature mean? Fundamentally, here's what temperature is. Temperature is a measure of, it's not directly, but it's a measure of the average kinetic energy of the particles. The colder it is, the less kinetic energy. The warmer it is, the more kinetic energy. This is why when <clears throat> you wash the dishes and you get the water too hot and you stick your hand in that hot water, you go, ooh, ow, that's hot. Why is it hot? Well, because those, those molecules are moving fast and they're hitting your skin and it hurts. Heat. Okay, uh, next piece, surface area. Well, this is just real easy. Surface area is uh, <clears throat> length times width. If you have a square, let me draw one over here on the board. Surface area is a square. It would just be length times width. Oops, that's a horrible W. Length times width, that's easy. Or a triangle, one half base times height. Or a circle, pi r squared. Or whatever, it's just the area that makes up an object. That's easy. The surface area of, uh, 
a cylinder, for instance, I've got a jar of an old jar, an old can of uh, stain here, okay? And I, I don't, I'm not trying to advertise it, I actually don't like stain. But anyway, to find the area of this can, you just find the surface area of the top plus the surface area of the bottom, wow, that's rusty, and the area of this edge around the middle here. Then that'd be, you uncurl that and that would be a, a square. So two circles and a square that's wrapped around to itself. And you, that's the surface area. So it's just the surface area that makes up whatever it is you're talking about. It could be just about any, it could be any shape. It could be a person, the surface area of a person. That'd just be the area of the skin on a person, okay? So that's what surface area is. Now the next topic you need to talk about, we need to talk about, has to do with surface area. It's pressure. Now remember, a while back, a few chapters ago, I told you that force and pain are directly correlated. So the harder you get hit with a fist, the more pain you have. Because force and pain are directly correlated. But let me add into that statement another piece. And to, to make you understand this, I'm gonna just, I, I would, you'll have to do this on your own, okay? So put your hand on the table and take maybe um, a one gallon bucket and put that one gallon bucket, fill it up with water and set it on top of your hand. Does it hurt? Mm, not really, but you'll feel some push on it, right? There's a small amount of pain as it pushes on your hand. But now take that same five gallon bucket, that, that save one, same one gallon bucket, and put between your hand and that bucket your pencil, lead down. And put the one gallon bucket on top of that pencil, and if you could balance it there, would that hurt? Yeah, that would hurt a lot more. So let me change my statement that I said earlier, because now you have more tools and we can understand it better. Pain is directly related to pressure. So let me, let me give you the equation for this. Pressure is defined as, remember the three lines mean defined as, force over area. Surface area. What does this mean? That means the more force, the more pressure. And remember, I'm telling you, pain is proportional to pressure. But pressure is proportional to force, so that what I told you before is still true, it's just that now you know more information. The more force you have, the more pressure you have, and the more pressure you have, the more it hurts. But also there's another piece. Area is downstairs, it's inversely related. So as area goes down, i.e. the point of your pencil, then pressure is going to go up. So even if the force stays the same, the one gallon bucket full of water, the force is the same. If the pressure goes down, I'm sorry, if the area goes down, the pressure will still go up and you'll get more pain. Okay, so I hope that helps you understand pressure a little more intuitively, but in, mathematically it's just simply force over surface area. And you'll see me, I go back and forth, sometimes I say area, sometimes I say surface area, whatever, tomato, tomato, it all means the same thing. Okay, so there's the concepts that you need to know before we can even start talking about this stuff. So uh, now that you've got all those concepts, let's move on to one specific thing, air pressure atmospheric pressure. So right now, if you can take on your hand and you take a pen and you draw out one square inch on your hand, one square inch on your hand and you hold it out in front of you here, that one square inch, on top of that one square inch, all the way up to the top of our atmosphere, all the way up to the top of our atmosphere, all those molecules of air, all the nitrogen and oxygen and all the other stuff, all that has weight. Because all those things have mass. And remember, weight is mass times gravity. So all those things have weight. And the weight of all those molecules is 14.7 pounds. That's the weight of one square inch 
of air. 14.7 pounds. That's a one column of air going up to the edge of our atmosphere. And then you say, well, where is the edge of our atmosphere? Well, it's way up there, at least 60,000 meters, maybe more. Okay, and you wanna know what is that in feet? Well, multiply by three, roughly 180,000 feet. It was a little more than that, but it's hard to say exactly where our atmosphere stops because there's still stuff up, it gets, there's stuff pretty high up there. But my point is, because of the way the air is, air is compressible. So the air is more dense down here than it is up there. It's more compressed down here. And <clears throat> on one square inch of your hand, all that column of air all the way up to the edge of our atmosphere weighs 14.7 pounds. Okay, thus, let me just say, let me remind you, look at this equation. Pressure is force over area. So the, atm the pressure of the atmosphere is 14.7 pounds per square inch. Or if you were to say it in standard English, PSI, pounds per square inch, 14.7. That's the pressure of our atmosphere. Now, Let's pause for just a minute there and, and let me explain, let me talk about that. <clears throat> that means that right now on my hand, so I've got one, I drew one square inch right there, that's one square inch. But on the rest of my hand, I've got a bunch more square inches. There's maybe, there's maybe 15 square inches there, okay? So let's see, 15 square inches Let's just round that up. Let's call, it, let's call it 20 square inches just to make the math easy. So it's 20 square inches on my hand, okay? And let's just round this off to 15, 15 pounds per square inch, and I've got 20 square inches. <laughs> that means right now on my hand, I've got 300 pounds pushing it down. <laughs> you ready for this? Check this out, ready? I just arm curled. 300 pounds with one hand. Ha <laughs> ha! And you're saying, uh uh, you didn't really. Well, you're right, I didn't. Why not? Shouldn't it? I mean, there's 300 pounds pushing down on my hand. That's true. One of the things you need to know about pressure is that pressure always acts perpendicular to the surface. So there's 300 pounds pushing down here because that's the surface of this hand. But guess what? My hand has another side. And so when I hold my hand like this, yes, I've got 300 pounds pushing down here, but I've got another side to my hand over here. And there's 300 pounds pushing up there. So 300 here and 300 here, what does that add up to? Oh yeah, nothing. Oh, so what did I arm curl? Oh yeah, I really am a wimp. Okay, anyway, does this kind of make sense? I hope so. This 14.7, that's in the English system. What is it in the metric system? In the metric system, the atmospheric pressure uh, is, and this is a number that I expect you to memorize. Just like gravity is 9.8, I expect you to memorize that. This one I also expect you to memorize. The pressure of the atmosphere is 101.325 newtons, that's a force, per meters squared. You say, that's a big number. Why is that number so much bigger than that number? Well, think about this. One inch, well, that's tiny. One square inch. How big is a square meter? Oh, that's huge. Oh yeah, there's a lot more force there. So 101,325 newtons per square meter. And by the way, physicists are lazy. And we don't like to say newtons per square meter. That takes a lot of words. So we usually don't say this. We usually just say, Pascal's. It's named after Mr. Pascal, the same guy, the same mathematician. You probably heard about him from your math class. Anyway, we, we, it's, that unit is named after Pascal. It just makes life a little easier. Okay, so I hope you understand atmospheric pressure now. Um, and uh, I hope that helps make sense. Just another side note here, um, on your bicycle pump, before you pump up your tire, what's the gauge read? It reads, zero. Why does the gauge read zero? 
shouldn't there be just 14.7 PSI pushing on it before you even start pumping? The answer is yes. We humans, as we make gauges for bicycle pumps and tire pumps and all the other kind of pumps, the gauge pressure, we define it as starting at zero, even though it really starts at 14.7. So this is the ap absolute atmospheric pressure. The gauge pressure is zero at one atmosphere. Okay, so that's just a side note, uh, just to help you know what you're doing when you're pumping up your bicycle tires. Okay, so next concept you need to understand. Density. What is density? Well, there's a definition here is mass per volume. That's all it is, mass per volume. So let me give you an example. I can take a chunk of styrofoam and cut it. I'd have to use a hot knife to cut it because styrofoam is hard to cut. But if you cut a chunk of styrofoam and it's, I don't know, one foot by one foot by one foot, and you hold it in your hand, how heavy, how heavy would that be? Uh, it wouldn't be very heavy because it's styrofoam. But if I took a chunk of, I don't know, oak, and I cut a chunk of oak out, it'd have to come from a big tree, and I cut out one cubic foot of oak, and I put that in my hand, would that be what heavy? Yeah, that'd be pretty heavy. That'd probably weigh 40, 50 pounds. Why? Aren't they the same size? They're both one cubic foot. They are the same size. They're the same volume but they have different masses. Oak has more mass than styrofoam. So the density of oak is greater than the density of styrofoam. Okay, so I hope that helps you make sense of density uh, as just mass over volume. And by the way, just as a rule of thumb, things that are more dense sink. So here's some liquids, and they put food coloring in each liquid, but the most dense liquid here is the yellow liquid. You, 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 it might, I don't know what the liquid was, maybe it's a shampoo or something like that, but somehow they colored it yellow, and they dropped it in there, and it sunk to the bottom. And then they put some, some red liquid in there, and it, it was less dense than the yellow liquid, so it floats on top of the yellow liquid and then so on and so forth. And you can kind of see the, the blue and the green are starting to mix. Different fluids will diffuse into each other, but that's another thing we'll talk about some other day. But my point is, the least dense floats on top. That, in this case, that'd be the green. So uh, that's just a rule of thumb. It works though, it works well. So speaking of floating, one of the things that you need to know about when you talk about floating is this character named Archimedes. Okay, so let me tell you a story about Archimedes. And this is a true story, so the story goes. I, I, it's, it probably is really true, although so, from so long ago, it's hard to say for sure if it's true, but most people agree this is true. Archimedes was a character back in the days of the ancient Greeks, okay? And, uh, he was a Greek guy, he's long since dead now, and, and he had lots of things that he invented. He was really a very clever fellow. And um, he was the smartest guy in his area. And one day the king commissioned a goldsmith to make him a new crown. And the goldsmith was a clever goldsmith and a good goldsmith. And so he made the king a real fancy crown. And the king gave him some specifications. He said, I want the crown to look good. It's got to be beautiful. It's got to be real nice. But I don't want to give me a headache. I got to wear the thing all day. So don't make it too heavy. It's got to be real lightweight. And it's going to be kind of, you know, but noble looking, you know, and all those sort of things that kings want in a crown. And so the goldsmith said, okay, okay, I got it. I'll go make you one. So the goldsmith went off, made him a crown brought it back to the king and said, here's your new golden crown, king. And the king said, oh, I like this. It's nice. It's lightweight. Oh, that's good. And, and oh, it fits my head real good. It's real pretty. It's real noble. I like it. Good job, goldsmith. Here's your pay. Paid the goldsmith for the price of the gold and, and then for the price of his labors. And the goldsmith walked away happy and the king walked away happy and all was well. Till... One day, the king was sitting on his throne, thinking about his nice, pretty crown. He said, oh, this crown, I really like this crown. I like this crown a lot. And he takes it off and looked at it and he said, you know, what if that goldsmith was a cheat? 
What if that goldsmith cheated me? What if this isn't actually gold? Oh, if this isn't gold, I'm going to chop that goldsmith's head off. Hmm. But I don't want to destroy the crown because I like the crown. I got to figure out though, is this really gold or is it not really gold? I don't know. How do I figure this out? I don't know. Well, here's what I'll do. I'll call the smartest guy around, Archimedes. So he called in Archimedes. Archimedes came in and the king explained the predicament to him and said, I got to know, is it gold or is it not gold? But don't you cut my crown open because if you cut my crown open, you'll destroy it. And I like this crown. So don't cut it open, but figure out, is it gold or is it not gold? Surely you're a smart guy, Archimedes. You can figure this out. So Archimedes said, hmm, I don't know if I can figure it out. I don't know. And he thought about it and he thought about it and he didn't come up with an answer. He said, okay, well, uh, give me some time. I'll think about it. I'll come back to you. And so he went home and Archimedes got home and he took a bath and he got in the bathtub and he filled the bathtub up all the way to the edge, got it hot. And then as he got into the bathtub, he yelled out, famous expression, Eureka! He's got it. As he's getting into the bathtub, it hit him like it, it just, bam, it got him. And he's got, Eureka means, I got it, I got it, I got it. He said, Eureka, here's the answer. And you're like, what on earth is the answer? And he was, the story goes that he was so excited that he ran in the buff all the way back to the king to tell the king the answer. I don't know if that part is true or not. Anyway, that's, that's how the story goes. But the key is, as he sat in the water, he noticed that he floated a little bit. And not only that, but also as he got in the water, and it was all the way full to the rim, as he got in the water, a bunch of the water spilled over the edge. And he said, huh, I think there's a concept here that's really important. The concept goes like this. If I weigh this chunk of whatever in air, it's going to weigh seven pounds. But if I drop that chunk of whatever in the water, it doesn't weigh as much. It weighs only four pounds or so. But what's going to happen is a lot of that water spilled out the edge and all the water that spilled over the edge added up is three pounds. Four plus three is seven. Huh. So here's Archimedes' principle. And it's written right up here. The buoyant force, the force that pushes something up in the fluid, is equal to the weight of the fluid displaced, in this case, water. So as you put this thing in here, it has volume. It takes up space. That volume goes where the water used to be. So the water that was there has to go somewhere. It's now displaced and it goes over the edge. And here there's a little pour spout and it all goes into the bowl. In Archimedes principle, it's a system that spilled over the edge of the bathtub. And so based on this, Archimedes came up with a nice little equation. And, and he didn't, well, whatever. This is the equation from Archimedes stuff. So there's two equations that you want to get here. I'm going to show you one in a second, but let me show you what this one says right here. This is the important one that you're going to use a lot. Okay, so this equation goes like this. The force of buoyancy, B-U-O-Y-A-N-C, is equal to weight of fluid displaced. Okay? That's, that's Archimedes' principle. Okay? So I'm just going to write this. FB, force of buoyancy, is equal to weight of fluid displaced. You know the equation for weight, right? Don't say 9.8. It's mass times 9.8. Okay, so this is mass times gravity, 9.8. Mass of what? Mass of fluid displaced. Fluid displaced. Okay, now 
we've already learned an equation, we learned it a few minutes ago, density equals mass per volume. You learned that equation just a few minutes ago. Density is mass per volume. So look at this. We can multiply volume on both sides. I'll just write V for volume. Multiply volume on both, both sides is going to cancel out there. So that tells us that mass is equal to density times volume. Okay, so I'm going to take this and put it in right there. Okay, so the force of buoyancy is equal to the density times the volume times gravity. I'll just write G. Density of what and volume of what? Density of the fluid displaced. Volume of what? Volume of the fluid displaced. If it's, but notice this, go back to this picture over here. The volume of the water displaced is equal to the volume of the submerged object. That's why it's displaced, because this thing takes up space and water used to be where it is now. So that water had to go somewhere, it got displaced, it got put over there. This volume and that volume are the same. So we can go back over here to this equation and we can rewrite this piece right here and put volume of submerged object because the volume of the fluid displaced and the volume of the submerged object are the same and this is what we use as Archimedes principle. It just comes from the way he said it. It's absolutely true. I'm not changing the, the wording of it. I'm just writing it out in math language because that's all we do over here in physics. We just describe the world around us with the language of math. Okay, so uh, one little note here before I show you the second version of this equation. Uh, notice your object that's submerged doesn't have to be completely submerged. Think of a boat. Is it completely submerged? Nope. Only part of it is. So the force of buoyancy on a boat is equal to the density of the fluid, water, times the volume of the submerged part of the boat. Not the whole boat, just the part submerged, times gravity. So sometimes the object is completely submerged and sometimes the object is partially submerged, but that's what this part is. It's just the part that's submerged, okay? So, uh, <clears throat> there you go. That's Archimedes' equation from his principle. Now let me show you the second equation. I'm not going to derive it for you like I derived this one. The second equation that Archimedes came up with is this. The density of an object And that little symbol there, that Greek letter rho, let me just write that up here. Density, we often write it like this. Greek letter rho, the, it's, just, it's just a shortcut. It's, it's just a Greek letter rho, it stands for density. Okay, so density of whatever the object is, is the mass in air divided by the mass in air minus the mass in water. So, and, and here's the beautiful part about this. This is such a nice little equation. It works with weights or masses. It works with the English system or the metric system or any other system you want to invent. It doesn't matter as long as you keep it consistent. You plug in these things and it will give you the density in grams per centimeter. Grams per centimeter cubed actually. Okay, so uh, with this equation in mind, mass in air, so if we were to figure out this object here, the mass in air we'd plug in is 7, and then we'd divide that by the mass in air, which is 7, minus the mass in water, which is 4. 
So that would be, so for this particular object, the density would be 7 divided by 7 minus 4, which would be 7 over 3, which is going to be 2 point 333 grams per centimeter cubed. Okay? So that's, that's, I don't know what that is right offhand. It's probably some chunk of metal. It's, it's pretty, pretty heavy. Okay? Which, by the way, while we're here talking about de standard densities, um, here's the third number that you have to memorize. There are three things you just, you can't get away from it. You've got to memorize them for this class. Gravity, planet Earth. What is it? 9.8. You've got to know that number. Second number you've got to know. Pressure of the atmosphere on planet Earth. 101, 325 Pascals. You've got to know that number. That's the second thing you've got to memorize. Here's the third thing you've got to memorize. Density of water. Good old-fashioned H2O. That density is 1,000 kilograms per meter cubed. You need to know that number. There's three numbers you need to know. That's one of them. Okay, so just write that on the side of your paper, circle it, star it, memorize it. You got to memorize that. The whole metric system is based on this. Okay, um, and just as a side note, those of you who had a chemistry class, chemists will tell you the density of water is one. And then I'm over here in the physics class telling you density is a thousand. And you're saying, wait a second, either my chemistry teacher's lying to me or my physics teacher's lying to me. Who's lying? Whether well, neither one of us are lying, we're both telling you the same thing. You're saying one is not the same as a thousand. Who's lying to me? Look at the units. In physics, we use units of kilograms and meters cubed. In the chemistry department, they use units of grams and centimeters cubed. So one gram per centimeter cubed or a thousand kilograms per centimeter cubed, whatever, Tomato, tomato, that's the answer. So just think about this for a second. Centimeter cubed, how big is that? Centimeter by centimeter by centimeter. Oh, that's a little bitty box, isn't it? How much, do, if I filled that little bitty box up with water, how much would it weigh? One gram. Compared to this, cubic meter. One meter by one meter by one meter. Oh, that's a big box. Fill that with water. How much does that weigh? Well, that's a thousand kilograms. Yeah, that's heavy. Okay. Yeah, that's a big box. You fill that whole thing with water, that's going to be real heavy. Okay, so these are the same statements. They're both the density of water, but this is what you use in chemistry class. So I don't expect you to memorize that for this class, but this is what you use for physics class. Okay. So uh, with that said, we can try our first example. So let's go back to Archimedes for a minute. <clears throat> There's the crown. That's not the actual one. It's just you know, made up crown. Okay, so there's the crown that the king had. And uh, just as a side note, the density of gold in the chemistry units is 19.3 grams per centimeter cubed and the physics units is 19,300. Wait a second, pause. Is that more dense or less dense than water? What's the density of water? You have to memorize it. 1,000. This is 19,000. Which one is more dense? Gold is more dense than water. A lot more dense. And by the way, if you have gold and you drop it in a bucket of water, what does it do? It sinks. Why is that? Remember the rule of thumb? More dense things sink. Gold is more dense than water, so if you put it in water, it's going to go to the bottom. There you go. Okay, that's just a side note. Now let's get to the question. The question is, the, coal, the crown has a mass of 0.05 kilograms in air and 0.03 kilograms in the water. Is it gold? Hmm. Well, let's use Archimedes' equation. That second equation that I gave you. Okay, so let me clear off some board space here. The density is equal to the mass in air divided by the mass in air minus the mass in water, which for this problem is 0.05 divided by 0.05 minus 0.03, which is 0.05 divided by 0.02. Oh man, there's sawdust on my floor. Ah, 
Did I mention I'm in the workshop here? I'm in my workshop. I'm always doing something with wood. There's wood all over the floor. Sawdust. Okay. <clears throat> 0.02, I'm sorry, 0.05 divided by 0.02. Uh, let's see, that's going to be 2 and uh, 1 fifth, which is 2.2 .2 grams per centimeter cubed. Is it gold? Look, gold is 19.3. What's this? 2.2. .2. Is that gold? Nope. That's not gold. That's like aluminum. This is an aluminum crown that's been spray painted with gold. Yeah, that gold's missed a cheat. <laughs> oh, and by the way, as the story goes, back in Archimedes' day, that real goldsmith did actually cheat the king, and the king did chop his head off. <laughs> so the story goes. Okay, I hope all this is sinking in. Uh, I hope I did that math right. I did that in my head. Well, I'll let you all punch it out in your calculator, and you can figure it out on your own. 0.05 over 0.02, I'll let you figure that out. Okay, uh, let's talk about something else. Why do things float? I've already given you two things, okay? The first thing is the rule of thumb, right? More dense things sink, less dense things float. That's a nice rule of thumb. It's not really a good reason though, it's just a rule of thumb, okay? Second reason, Archimedes principle. If you submerge even part of an object, there's a force of buoyancy pushing up on the object that's equal to the weight of the fluid displaced. Now, I want to look at this boat here for a minute. Just, this is a big old honking boat. What are these, this is a, this is, what's this thing made out of? Iron. That thing's made out of iron. Now, last I checked, iron is very dense. What happens to a chunk? If you take a chunk of iron and drop it in the water, what does it do? It sinks. Why? Well, because it's more dense than water. And yet here's a, a, a freight liner made out of iron in the ocean, and it's floating. Now, the story gets worse than that. Look at this. What is it carrying? Well, each one of those boxes that you see there is a semi-truck. That's a lot of semi-trucks, and those are just the ones you see above on the deck. It's got that many below deck. Each one of those semi-trucks is made out of iron. And then there's all this stuff that, has, that they use to move those iron boxes around and where the captain has to sit just to see where he's going. And all that stuff is iron. And this thing's floating. How does that work? Well, here's the way it works. Archimedes principle. This is the second way. I told you there's three ways to look at this. The second way to look at this is Archimedes principle. Part of that boat is underwater. And that part of the boat that's underwater displaced water. That water which was displaced is heavy. It displaced a lot of water. That's a big old honking boat. That's a whole lot of water. And water has a density of 1,000 kilograms per meter cubed. That density and that volume of water that's displaced is real heavy. So heavy that it's equal to the force of buoyancy pushing it up is equal to the weight of all that iron pulling it down. Plus whatever these boats are filled out of. I mean, maybe they're, I don't know, if it's coming down from South America, maybe it's filled with coffee or bananas or something like that. Whatever. Anyway, it's, there's weight pulling it down. All that iron and all that cargo has weight and it's pulling it down. But the boat has displaced water and all that water has a, f a weight. And the weight of the displaced water is equal to the force pushing it up, which we call the force of buoyancy. And if it's floating, the weight equals the force of buoyancy. They're the same quantity. Okay, so that's the second way to look at this. Now there's a third way to look at this. Okay, so let me show you the third way of looking at this. And I forgot, I gotta show you the next slide here. There's an equation that you have to know before I can explain the third way of looking at this. The equation is this. 
Pressure is density times gravity times depth. Let me say this in common English. The deeper you go, the more pressure there is. That's what that says. The deeper you go, the more pressure there is. You know this intuitively, right? You've been swimming before. What happens when you go down to the bottom of the deep end of the pool? It hurts your ears. Why does it hurt your ears? Because there's a bunch of water stacked on top of you and all that water has weight and it's pushing on your ears and it hurts. Pressure increases with depth. That's what this tells you. The act, exact value of pressure is equal to the density of the fluid times gravity times that depth. Okay, so with that in mind, let me draw a picture over here. Okay, so... <clears throat> I'm going to draw, oh, I don't have a blue marker. That's sad. Okay. I've got a green marker here, and that's water, okay? And I'm going to have uh, an object, I don't know what it is, a chunk of who knows what. Chunk of iron. I don't care what it is. Chunk of something, okay? And it's a big cube. I'm going to make it a cube because <laughs> cubes are easy to draw, and I'm not a very good artist, okay? So <clears throat> there's pressure pushing on this chunk of iron. Pressure due to the weight of the fluid pushing on it, okay? So, uh, is there pressure on this face over here? Yeah, there is. Which way does it go? Remember what I told you? Pressure is always pushes perpendicular to the surface. So it's pushing perpendicularly here, so the pressure on this side is going to push it this way. But, don't forget that pressure increases with depth. So the pressure at the top of this side is not as much as the pressure on the bottom of this side. It's going to get the pressure at the top is going to be less than the pressure at the bottom. So the pressure on this side is all pushing it that way. Well, then why doesn't the block go this way? Well, because there's another side of this block. There's six sides to this block. On this side over here that you can't see, there's a pressure over here. And the pressure at the top is about like that, and the pressure at the in the middle is about like that, and the pressure at the bottom is about like that. And when you add all these pressures and all these pressures, what do you get? Zero. These pressures are pushing it this way. These pressures are pushing it this way. They all add up to nothing. Let's look at the front face. The front face, all the pressures are going to look just like this. A little bit more, 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 hold most at the bottom. And they're all pushing it backwards. Why doesn't it go backwards? Well, because there's a backside, and they're going to do the same, and those are going to add up to zero too. But the top and the bottom are different because the top part of this, which way does the pressure push it? Well, remember, it always pushes perpendicular to the surface, so this pressure is pushing it down, but it's at the top, so it's not very much. Well, it has an opposite face. What's the opposite face? What's well, the bottom? And which way does that push? Well, that's going to push it up. But pressure increases with depth. So the pressure on the bottom is much more than the pressure at the top. And this is the third reason. Fundamentally, this is why things float. Because the pressure at the bottom is always greater than the pressure at the top. Therefore, the net pressure is always up. And that's why things float. The net pressure from the sides all adds up to zero, so those don't matter. But the, only the pressures from the bottom and the top add up to something. They never add up to zero. They always add up to something, and that something is always up. That's why there's a force of buoyancy. And by the way, I drew a cube because cubes are easy to draw. It could have been a potato or a human. It doesn't matter. The net pressure will always be up. So that's the third reason why things float. That's the third way to look at it. That third way is the fundamental reason. So be able to explain that, be able to articulate that, um, because that's kind of a, a tricky thing to explain. Okay? So with that said, let's do another example here. Um, <clears throat> what is the pressure on your ears when you are three meters underwater? Okay? So uh, let's draw this here. Instead of an iron block, we've got you, and you're underwater. Here's you. Okay, and you're underwater, and here's your ears. 
I don't know why your ears are so big, but there's your ears. And they're three meters underwater. And the question is, what's the pressure on your ears? Okay, well, let's figure this out. Remember, pressure is equal to density times gravity times depth. And then you say, but why did you put an H there? Shouldn't you put a D there? Uh, yeah, but, you know, I, it's not my fault. It's just the way it was. It's a long time ago. Somebody said, let's use H for depth. And I, I'm just, it's just the way it is. Depth. I mean, think of the last letter, depth. <laughs> There's an H there, okay? It's depth, okay? So density times gravity times depth. What, is, what's, what's your, what are you swimming in? Water. What's the density? Oh, you got to memorize this one. That's a thousand. Times gravity. Oh, you got to memorize that one. 9.8. And depth. What's the depth of this? Three. There you go. This is the pressure from the water. Okay? And so what's that pressure? I, I punched it out for you. It's uh, 29400. So the pressure from the water is 29,400 or 29,400 pascals. That's the pressure on your ears. Now, that's just the pressure from the water. Remember what pressure is in terms of things pushing on your ears here. That's this column of water pushing down on your ears. But what's pushing down on the water? air. Remember there's about five miles of air stacked on top of this water and all that air has weight too. Has pressure. What's the pressure of the air? So we gotta, don't forget there's the pressure of the atmosphere pushing down on this water. And what's that? Well that's the other number you gotta memorize. Don't forget you gotta memorize this one too. It's 101325 Pascals. So the pressure from the air, the atmosphere, is 101,325, and the pressure from the water is 29,400. So the total pressure on your ears is that one plus that one, and I punched that out already. It's 130,725 Pascals which, by the way, is about 129% of the atmosphere. That's going to hurt. It's not going to hurt too bad, but it'll hurt. Okay? I hope that example makes sense. If it doesn't, you'll have to send me an email. Ask me. Uh, or or uh, um, do, set up a, a Google Meet and we can talk through it. So, um, by the way, that's true for any of this stuff. If I say something silly and I goof it up, send me an email, let me know. If, if, if as I'm saying it, you just don't get it, that's fine. That happens. That happens a lot. That's okay. That's, you're learning. That's, that's how you learn. You have to struggle through this. So if you ha get stuck on anything, send me an email, and I might be able to answer it on email. If not, uh, we'll, we'll do a Google Meets. Um, or if it's a question that I think everybody's going to have, I might make another video just about your question. So uh, anyway, there you go. Okay, next example. <clears throat> Why is there a railroad track beside the Panama Canal? And you say, huh? I didn't know there was a railroad track beside the Panama Canal. Yep. Here's a map. This is an old map, but it hasn't changed. The canal goes from this bay through this thing here. There's a big lake in here. And it goes through that bay and through this channel. They cut it out. And it goes into this lake. And then it goes along this, this river system. And then it goes out there. Here's the Atlantic Ocean. Here's the Pacific Ocean. Panama Canal. And you say, well, what's the Panama Canal? Panama Canal? This is huge. This thing is, this is, this is a great thing. Here's what I mean. <clears throat> You'll have to forgive my horrible artistry skills here. Okay, but uh, here's uh, North America. Let's see, here's Maine and Florida and Texas, and it goes down here. Uh, and here's, by the way, Texas, there's a Baja Peninsula over here, and, and Mexico does down, down there, and uh, 
California and Canada, there's North America up there, okay? And this goes down here, and there's Canada and a bunch of other little bitty countries, and then it gets skinny really for a little while, and then it opens up into this big other continent. This is uh, Colombia, Venezuela, and stuff like that. And this down here is South America, okay? Now, if you were delivering something from, say, England, and you wanted to send it to California, how are you gonna get there? Well, back in the day, if you wanted to do that, you had to go from England, and you had to go all the way down here, around South America, and then all the way around here, up to California. That's a long ways. And not only is it a long ways, down here, you're right down there next to Antarctica. And it's cold down there. Not only is it cold, it's notorious for horrible storms all the time. Lots and lots of dead people in that ocean down there because people died all the time trying to go around the corner of South America. It was a deadly place. It still is a deadly place, okay? It's a dangerous passage to go this way. Somebody had the wise idea somewhere along the line that said, you know what? What if we could just dig us a canal and we just find this skinny spot right here and just go boop? Dig us a canal through there, and then we want to send stuff from Europe or Africa or whatever, and send it over here. We just go over, down, bloop, and then go over here to California. Well, that'd be e it's pleasant weather there. It'd just go real easy. Just go right over there. Save the trouble, all the distance, time, money, and danger, all cut out. What a wonderful idea. Well, the problem was, there wasn't really a good way to do that. So the first folks to try to make this happen were the British. They came over here, and they tried to make it happen. They brought over all their big steam shovels. and Actually, I don't think they had steam shovels yet. They just, I think they just brought a bunch of folks with, sho with shovels. And they were working on it, and they dug and dug and dug, and they finally gave up. They gave up. Why? Because of the mosquitoes. They were getting malaria left and right. They just, it was a deadly task to try to build the Can Panama Canal. So the British gave up and went home. They just didn't finish it. French came over. They said, that's a still a great idea. We'll do it. Well, they had the same problem. They gave up and went home too. The Americans said, well, that's really a great idea. We'll do it. And guess what we did? <laughs> so we finished the Panama Canal that everybody else had started. And now there's a Panama Canal there. Okay. Now here's the problem. When you went, when you go to build the, when you go to go through the canal, the canal is fed by this river system. Now, rivers are filled with what kind of water? Fresh water. Oceans are filled with what kind of water? Salt water. Now, I don't expect you to memorize this number, but let me tell you how this number goes. The density of water I do expect you to memorize that number. You already got it though, right? It's 1,000 kilograms per meter cubed, okay? But the density of salt water is different. Salt water is more dense than fresh water. You go, huh, that's interesting but I don't care. What does that have to do with this? Everything. Think about it. You're coming over here from wherever. You, you, you've got a manufacturing business, or better yet, you've got a shipping business, and you've got a customer over here that makes who knows what down in Africa, okay? And they're making something over here in Africa, and they've got to ship it over here to California. So you, you, you run the shipping business. So <laughs> you're like UPS, you run the tightest ship in the shipping business. And you want to you want to be a, have a profitable business. You don't take one crate with you. How many crates do you take? As many as you can. It's expensive to go, over, to go over there. It takes time. It takes fuel. It's expensive. It doesn't happen quick. So you're going to take as many crates of this stuff as you can. Well, what are you limited by? You're just going to keep stacking and stacking and stacking? Yeah. You're going to keep stacking and stacking. When are you going to stop stacking? If you stack any more, you're going to sink your ship. That's how you quit. You stack and stack and stack until any more would cause your ship to sink. So you get this thing loaded to the max as much as you can carry. Any more and the thing's going to sink. Okay? And then you go across the ocean and you get over here to the Panama Canal 
and something happens. And let me remind you of Archimedes' equation. What does Archimedes say? Archimedes says that the force of buoyancy is equal to the density of the fluid times the volume of the submerged object times gravity. When you go from the Atlantic Ocean to the river system of the Panama Canal, does gravity on planet Earth change? Nope. Does the amount of your ship underwater change? Well, it can't. Remember, because if you put any more underwater, you're going to sink the whole thing. So no, you can't change that one. That's fixed. But this one changes. Remember, you go from salt water to fresh water. And fresh water is less dense. And so if, fluid, if the density of the fluid goes down, guess what happens? Force of buoyancy goes down. If the force of buoyancy goes down, what happens to your ship? It sinks. Oh. So you can't even use the Panama Canal. It's this nice little shortcut. It saves all kinds of lives, but you can't even use it because you've got your cargo ship loaded to the max. Which, by the way, all cargo ships do. It's the only way to be profitable. They have to do it. Otherwise, they'll lose money and go out of business. We need that business to exist, so we have to make them profitable. So they have to load it to the max. So they load it to the max, and they get to the bay, and right before they get in to the Panama Canal, they stop right here. And they unload part of their cargo and put it on the railroad system and send their cargo on the railroad all the way to the other side. Not all the cargo, just part of the cargo. Well, why did they do that? So they're not as heavy. And then they send their boat with part of its cargo through the Can Panama Canal, fresh water, come out the other side, reload, and then go on to California. Why is there a railroad beside the Panama Canal? So the boats don't sink when they get into the canal. And you say, that's pretty clever. Who thought of that? I don't know. You say, well, did they know that before they built it? Yeah, they were smart folks. They had this figured out. But that's why they built the railroad at the same time as they built the canal. In fact, they used the railroad because in order to build that canal, you had to use steam shovels. They didn't have diesel shovels like we use now. They had to use steam shovels. It was big and bulky and had a lot of fuel. They had to transport all the coal to run the thing. And they had, those are big and heavy. How do you transport big, heavy things through the, de through the jungle? Railroad. So step one, build a railroad. Step two, use the railroad to transport the stuff you need to dig the canal. There you go. And then when you get done, you've got a railroad right beside the canal that you can use to transport the cargo from one end to the other. Okay, there you go. That's a lot of stuff for one day. There's more stuff with Chapter 5, but that's a good place to end for the day. So you can get started on the homework, and uh, there you go. Have a good day.